Hello and welcome. My name is Margaret Nichols, and I'm going to be talking to you today about top sutured handle bodies as twisted homology products. Um, this is a two part talk. So in the first part right now, um, we'll just be focusing on definitions and motivation. Um, and in particular, just talking about top sutured manifolds. We'll end the talk with the sort of core question that I want to address in the second part of this talk when we'll actually get talking about twisted homology products. So with that, let's get started. So first off, um, we're sort of motivated by studying foliations on our three manifold. What is a foliation? Um, this is essentially a choice of a local product structure on our three manifold. And we're going to be focusing on co-dimension one foliations, which means that we're going to be putting a R2 cross R1 product structure on neighborhoods of our manifold, which means that we are choosing a sort of horizontal plane direction and filling out our local patches by an R's worth of these horizontal planes. And when we patch all of these different local product structures together, we want to be doing so in such a way that these planes line up. So we are actually sort of filling out M with all of these surfaces that are just sort of stacked together. Um, and these surfaces that we get from this local product structure, these are what we call the leaves of the foliation. So why are we interested in studying a foliation? The idea is that this gives our manifold M more structure. It lets us view M not just as this floppy three manifold, but as something that's actually sort of comprised of this family of surfaces. And we can then use tools and techniques from the study of surfaces and surface topology to get better leverage towards understanding our manifold itself. Um, so when we're looking at foliations that are, there are better and worse choices of foliation we can use and the sort of best choice is one that's called a taut foliation. Um, now this definition that I'm giving here is not the most sort of immediately clear in terms of what it actually means and how it's useful, but it turns out to be sort of the correct definition. Um, so foliation is taut if there is a loop embedded in your manifold M that intersects every leaf of your foliation and intersects the, the leaves transversely. So I've drawn a cartoon on the left here of um, a one dimension lower cartoon of the foliation. So these horizontal lines we're thinking of as the leaves of F and then our loop will come through and intersect every leaf transversely. So you know, not necessarily perpendicularly, but um, we won't have any tangencies. So we have this transverse intersection. So what does this actually mean? Well, let's think about one thing that can go wrong. So I've drawn a cartoon on the right of um, what is called a rib component, which is the sort of classically bad behavior that can happen in a foliation, causing it to not be taut. So a rib component is a solid torus um, embedded in your three manifold, um, where the boundary torus is a closed leaf in your foliation. And the interior of this solid torus, the foliation looks like a bunch of nested planes, which are wrapping around um, the solid torus infinitely many times. Um, and filling out the torus in this way. So why is this bad? So what happens when we try and look at a loop, our transverse loop? Well, it has to enter our foliation somewhere, our solid torus somewhere, so it intersects our boundary torus, and then it starts meeting our planes. Um, but when it intersects our planes, it still has to be transverse, and so it sort of gets directed towards the middle, the core of the solid torus, and it wraps around here and it keeps wrapping and there's really no way for it to escape. 
It's just stuck. So this sort of acts as a dead end, preventing you from finding this transverse closed loop. This is bad. And we can say immediately that if we have a top foliation, we don't, we can't get any of these components. That said, this doesn't really give a lot of insight into, you know, besides excluding these components, what our top foliation looks like. And so a basic question you can ask is, when can you actually find top foliations? Which three manifolds admit top foliations and what do they look like? And the second version of this question, um, maybe you have some particular um, surface embedded in your um, three manifold that you wanna understand better. And maybe you would like to do that by saying, can I realize this closed surface as a leaf of some top foliation on my three manifolds? So this is the second version of this question that we're going to focus on a bit more here. So let's, let's think about this question a little bit more carefully. And this question is going to sort of motivate where we transition into talking about suture manifolds. Um, so I'm going to sort of describe a, a construction here where we take our um, three manifold with this particular surface that we like in it, embedded in it, and we're going to cut open M along this surface S. Um, and we're going to assume that M is in fact, for the moment, a closed manifold. Um, ignore any boundary components. So what happens when we cut open along S, we get a new manifold with boundary. Its boundary is two copies of S. So it looks something, okay, here's one copy of S, and then we're going to have a second copy of S. And then M fills in the middle. So this is M minus S. So I just wanna make a comment about this. Um, so first of all, we'll define this more carefully on the next slide, but this is our first example of a sutured manifold. Um, secondly, why, uh, why does this sort of give any traction towards thinking about top foliations? Well, if we have a top foliation on M with S as a closed leaf, that foliation sticks around when we cut open along S. We get a foliation on M minus S, um, which now has two closed leaves, um, or, or it has two copies of S as closed leaves. Um, on the other hand, if we had a foliation on the right of this cut open manifold. When we glue, this will have S as closed leaves. When we glue back together along S, that will give us a foliation in M with S as a closed leaf. So it's giving us a way of sort of focusing on and saying, you know, any foliation on the right will give me this particular type of foliation in my original picture. So let's give the more sort of complete definition of a sutured manifold. It's a little bit more general than this cut open your closed three manifold along um, a closed surface. Uh, so we're going to consider a sutured manifold as being um, M is a three manifold with boundary. And we have two other sort of pieces of data that are, that are um, essentially describing a structure on the boundary of M. So we're going to take gamma to be a disjoint collection of simple closed curves in the boundary of M. We want these to be together separating the boundary. And as they separate, it's going to split the boundary of M into two disjoint subsurfaces which we'll call R plus and R minus. So choosing sort of coherent orientations on the curves of gamma, um, we can say R plus is what lies on the positive side of all of our curves and R minus is what lies on the negative side. So I've drawn down here my sort of 
prototypical example I have in my head of what a sutured manifold looks like. Um, so this is a genus two handle body, um, which is to say it's sort of a, a genus two surface where you've filled it in in the obvious way. Um, and now I'm just, my suture structure here, it's just a single curve separating the, the genus two boundary into two um, tori with one boundary component. And of course you can have much more, you know, this picture could sort of represent any suture manifold with a, you know, single genus two boundary component um, where M is sort of filling in in some more interesting way in the middle, but I'll often be thinking about specifically handle bodies because they're sort of the, the simplest um, example we can be looking at where we, but we still see a huge amount of really rich behavior here. All right. So I want to give another sort of example of where these um, sutured manifolds can come into play, where we might sort of come up with them. And this is coming from studying knots and links in the three sphere, or really any, any manifolds. Um, so let's say we have a knot in S3, let's take the trefoil. Um, since that's a nice starting one, if we pick a cipher surface for M, um, we can, we can construct uh, M minus S by, okay, I've drawn this cypher surface for the tricoil here. Um, it consists of this inner disk here, this outer disk, which includes the point of it at infinity. And then it's connected by three sort of twisted bands, bands with a single twist in them. Um, so I just redrawn this on the right. We've got the two disks and three bands connecting them. So if I take, you know, this is my surface S. If I take M minus S, I can think of that as, since we're in S3, I can think of that as what happens when I sort of take an take an open neighborhood of my cypher surface S if I puff up S a little bit. Um, and then I can think of what's the complement of this in S3. So if I puff up my, um, my cypher surface, a neighborhood of this is, uh, well, I'm, I'm taking two, this is a, uh, uh, surface with a single boundary component, it turns out to be genus one. And so when I puff it up, the, the boundary of this puffed up version is a genus two surface. And it's not sort of tangled about itself in any way. The puffed up version, um, this neighborhood is a genus two handle body. And so because it's not sort of tangled around itself, the complement will also be homeomorphic to a genus two handle body. Um, all right, so I want to, in this setting of sutured manifolds, give a more combinatorial or just sort of algebraic way of understanding this notion of tautness. And to do so, I first need to define the Thurston norm which is a, well, not quite norm, it's actually a semi-norm on the second homology of M relative to the boundary. Uh, and in particular, we can actually say relative to some subset of the boundary, which will be more relevant for what we're talking about in a moment. But let's just sort of give the definition to start. Um, so first we wanna define a notion of complexity of an embedded surface in our, in our three manifold. Um, so if we have a connected surface, we say our complexity, this chi minus is, well, it's effectively negative the Euler characteristic, unless we had, you know, a sphere component or some other component with positive Euler characteristic, in which case we say 
ignore it. I don't care about that. That's not counting against me in my complexity. And then if we have a surface with multiple components, we define its complexity to be the sum of the complexity of the components. So this gives us a measure of complexity um, for any surface in our three manifold. And we define the Thurston norm of a homology class to be the simplest, you know, what is the simplest representative of a surface in the homology class? What's the complexity of that? Um, so we're minimizing over all representatives of our homology class. We're minimizing this chi minus complexity measure. So this gives us a measure of complexity for anything in integral homology, but I said I wanted to define my semi-norm on um, real homology. So let's, let's talk about how to extend this to, to real coefficients. Um, so first, um, we can extend this to rational coefficients by saying, well, we want this, we want this norm to be linear. Um, so if we take linear combinations of homology classes, we can get any rational homology class as a linear combination of our integral ones. And we can use this linear, linearity of our Thurston norm to, to give us rational coefficients. Um, and then if we want to do real coefficients, well, we want our norm to be continuous, so we can use that continuity to extend to real coefficients. All right, one last comment I want to make um, on the Thurston norm is that while this may seem sort of a strange definition, this actually lines up with something um, that you've maybe heard about, thought about before, which is not genus. Um, so if we're looking at this example of a uh, surface, a cipher surface for a knot in S3 or a link in S3, um, the, the Thurston norm of the um, class of that cipher surface is this expression in the knot genus. This is essentially just switching between Euler characteristic and genus. So asking what's the Thurston norm of um, you know, the sort of unique homology class in H2 of a knot complement is the same thing as asking what's the genus of that knot. All right, so with Thurston norm in hand, we can give a notion of tautness um, for a sutured manifold. Uh, so this is different from, this is sort of fundamentally different from when we were talking about taut foliations, there taut was a descriptor of a foliation, a particular choice of structure on our three manifolds. Um, but now we're giving a notion of what it means just for a sutured manifold to be taut. Um, and this is a very different field of definition than our foliation one. This is now just very topological. We're saying, um, I've already sort of written in my notes here, um, we're saying we want M to be irreducible. We want any sphere in our three manifold to bound, to actually bound a ball. Um, this is sort of a, the basic way of sort of factoring a three manifold, splitting it up into the, the sort of core pieces um, that contain the sort of essential topological information. Um, second, we want to know that these boundary subsurfaces are plus and minus are each incompressible in the three manifold, which is to say that, for instance, in R plus, um, if any loop in R plus that actually bounds a disk in M, that had to bound a disk in R plus itself. Um, so you don't have any sort of non-trivial, um, non-trivial disks being bound by loops. They all sort of were actually in the boundary itself. And finally, this last part, um, I have this sort of arrow here. Let's come back to that in a minute. Um, this last part is the Thurston norm. We're saying we want R plus and R minus to realize the Thurston norm 
Well, the Thurston norm in H2 of M with respect to, we're gonna look at our suture set gamma, this collection of simple closed curves in the boundary as this subset of the boundary of M that we're restricting to. And one, one note that I'll make, that was what this arrow was saying is that um, if you play around with this a bit, you can actually convince yourself that um, with sort of a really minor um, exception, this third condition envelops the second one. If you realize um, the Thurston norm, pretty much that's already telling you that you're incompressible. Um, so, so this is really the sort of big, big condition here. Tautness, you should think of as saying, our boundary subsurfaces are as simple as possible. And so this fact is really, you know, these, it's not an accident that these terms are the same. Um, this fact is saying that our original manifold, if we had some manifold M that we started with and we're saying, okay, does this manifold M admit a taut foliation with our particular surface as a closed leaf? Um, this is in fact equivalent to the suture manifold that we get by cutting open along S being top. Um, so this is pretty remarkable. Um, this is proved by Dave Gabay and really uh, the motivation for why, to why we should study sutured manifolds. It turns out that, the, that this definition of, of tautness um, gives rise to well, you can use a, what's called a sutured, uh, sutured manifold decomposition to sort of give an inductive structure on your sutured manifold um, where all of the uh, sutured manifolds in this uh, hierarchy are in fact taught and you can do inductive arguments in this way. So this prompts really sort of the motivational question that I want to raise and address in the second part of this talk which is, okay, we now have this sort of much more topological hands-on, um, hopefully more easily understandable property about a manifold that we can try to study to answer a question about the existence or non-existence of a particular top foliation. Um, so this question is, how can we certify that a suture manifold is taught? You hand me a suture manifold and say like, guess what, this is taught. Uh, how can I actually check that? How can I give a condition to say this does in fact realize, these boundary subsurfaces do in fact realize the first one? So we'll come back to that in part two of this talk. Thank you.